The, um, and basically, I'm here to talk about brain health. Um, and I'm wanting to uh, sort of bring you back with two messages. Um, so one is that um, when we talk about inevitability of aging, there's very little that's inevitable. Uh, most of it is in our control. Um, and the second is that we start that trajectory in youth. Um, so looking in terms of how our cumulative lifestyle is going to impact on whether or not we're going to enjoy our retirement um, is uh, an important issue because it may be well earned and you're going to want that time and what you don't want to end up is be in a situation where you're not able to, uh, to enjoy it. It's just going to take me a second to... Oh, here we go. So when we start to look at dementia, obviously um, you're, many of you in the audience are not at that age yet where you're starting to think about it, um, but you may have parents and grandparents that you're worried about. Um, and we know that dementia is a huge problem in North America, in part because we're living longer, so we're in many ways outliving our brain health. Um, the other piece that I think that people don't know is that women are more likely to develop dementia than men. Um, so that two-thirds of individuals um, with Alzheimer's disease are women, and that is not because we live longer. Women are actually at higher risk. Um, so what I would really like to do is focus on, so what can we do about it? What can we do in terms of making sure that we don't travel that particular route? And really letting you know that we understand a tremendous amount about how our lifestyle choices impact whether or not we develop uh, dementia. Um, and here is just kind of a clustering of the various ones of something put out by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. And that it is really starting with everything from having that head injury, if you're a hockey player and your youth, and cumulatively that's um, going to uh, impact uh, whether or not you have brain health later in life, to various types of things that we can really do something about, keeping ourselves physically active, eating well, making certain that we're socially and, and cognitively engaged uh, with time. So clearly what I'm interested in is the nutrition piece of it, um, and that I think that um, sort of in many ways the primary story is that there are a whole bunch of disorders that we know that are diet related and obesity related, um, whether it's hypertension, whether it's high blood cholesterol, whether it's developing type 2 diabetes, that we all understand that there's a lifestyle, exercise, nutrition connection in order in terms of protecting yourself against those disorders. We are not communicating well enough that these are dementia risk factors. Um, so that if you're developing these types of disorders in your youth, um, you're also putting yourself on a dementia trajectory. So when we look in terms of what's happening with our population dynamics and the increased prevalence of obesity and the increased prevalence of dementia-related chronic disorders, we know that as a population we're in trouble um, and that it's time that we start doing something about it. Um, so, and here's just a, I think, um, a very poignant example of it from some work that actually I was participating in, and it was looking at the impact of obesity in terms of our ability to um, multitask in terms of what we call uh, executive function, sort of go back and forth in terms of what you're thinking about. And that what we were seeing is that obese people um, had less ability to do this, and it was particularly for people that were carrying their obesity in frontally. Um, the sobering part of this particular study is that it's that last bullet point. Individuals were on average under 40 years of age. So we're already in youth seeing the negative impact of obesity-related disorders in terms of our cognitive function. And that's why I'm saying this is not a story of aging. This is a story of in taking care of our health through adulthood. We also really know that what we think about in terms of our traditional North American diet being high in fat, low in fiber, low in fruits and vegetables, we know that it's associated with those chronic disorders, so it's not surprising that it's also associated with dementia. As I was saying, because we're looking at the impact of these chronic disorders, we also know that it's our health in our 50s that is predictive of whether or not we're going to go on and develop dementia in our 70s. And it's not surprisingly, the longer you have blood pressure, the longer you have elevated cholesterol, the longer that you have type 2 diabetes, you have more and more cumulative insult to the brain. Uh, so that over time, it is likely to um, develop into a, uh, a full-blown dementia. 
So it is never too late to start to think about what you're wanting to do in retirement. So people often say, it's never too late to start your retirement planning financially, and I'm going to say it's never too late to start your, fight, your retirement planning from a, an overall health perspective as well. And that's because we know that brain aging occurs throughout our lifespan. I grew up in a time where it was kind of, uh, we didn't worry about brain health during adulthood, not until we really kind of got into our senior years. And it was assuming that there was something about chronologically turning 65 changed our brains. Um, well, that's not the case. Um, and that we know that a lot of the early changes that are occurring um, in, that would put us onto those dementia trajectories are happening between sort of the, the 20s and 50s of people. And that's the period of time where we think we really have to focus in terms of helping people make those types of choices in order to make certain that they're not having early Alzheimer's-like related changes. It's really simple when we understand diet, uh, that we know that what we need to do is increase our consumption of fruits and vegetables, um, fish should be included in our diet more regularly, and we really need to keep away from processed foods, highly processed foods because they're high in sodium and they're high in the wrong kinds of fat. And as you adopt a healthier diet, you also now know that you're adopting something that not only is going to help you with dementia prevention later down the road, but right now in this very period of time, it's going to be helping you think more clearly and crisply. Uh, so you're going to find advantages of that uh, as you're adopting it. So it's a simple message. We need to be focused in terms of our health. We need to focus early on, knowing that that's what we have to do in order to be able to protect our brain. But I'm increasingly concerned about the amount of misinformation that individuals are hearing. Um, and I think it makes it harder and harder for people to really know what they should be doing. So one is something that um, kind of comes out of my discipline, and where it's arguing really that a single nutrient is going to be able to fix a complex Problem. And we know that that's just not the case. Um, so you're going to hear about vitamin D or vitamin A or vitamin E, and popping back that one nutrient is not going to take care of the fact that the overall quality of your diet may, uh, may not be appropriate. As we study it then, I think there's more and more tendency to take these nutrients and either sell them in pill form or to incorporate them into less healthy foods. Um, and I will always argue that taking the essence of broccoli and putting it into a hamburger and fries is not going to make those hamburgers and fries healthy. We know that, but we, uh, but we still hope uh, but that that's not going to be the case. And this is just saying that there are many large medical organizations. This is the National Institute of Health that is arguing that there is no evidence um, that any single supplement is going to be beneficial. The other is that we're always being bombarded in terms of the new superfood. So whether it's um, blueberries or pomegranates or, uh, or kale, that people are talking about individual foods having these super qualities. And the brutal reality is we have no evidence whatsoever for that. Um, that when we look in terms of human studies, we have lots of evidence as it relates to food groups. Um, so for instance, we know that the cruciferous vegetables, of which kale is one, seems to be uh, neuroprotective. But whether kale is better than broccoli or better than cauliflower, we don't have any scientific evidence for that. And I will continue to argue that the super vegetable is the one that you'll put in your mouth. Um, there's no use going to the grocery store, buying the kale, and having it rot in your refrigerator. Buy what, you're gonna, what you like so that you can start making sure that you're increasing your exposures in terms of fruits and vegetables. You're also being bombarded by a huge amount of information. Um, and this is a sobering slide which is looking at, now that we're able to put health-related information on um, food packages, where is it going and how is that helping the consumer? Um, well, unfortunately, where is it going? It's going on foods that Canada's Food Guide says you shouldn't be eating anyway. Um, we know that we can go down that grocery aisle where we have snacks and, and potato chips and, and tacos, and we're going to see a host of um, health-related information in terms of take my potato chip, it's, it's got a healthier fat that I've fried it in, or take my Dorito because I've sprinkled a little bit of essence of broccoli on it. But you go down the vegetable aisle and there's no information at all. Um, so the way that we're getting information is not helping you direct you to the types of foods that you should be consuming. Um, 
So where do we have the evidence and, and what do we really need to be talking about in terms of helping people make the right types of changes in terms of their brain health? And this is just to say that we have a huge amount of evidence as it relates to the Mediterranean diet. Um, and that the evidence not only is uh, coming from Mediterranean countries where you can argue, yeah, if I was living on that Greek isle, I would be you know, calm and less stressed and my brain would be healthy as well. We have the same type of evidence coming out of downtown New York City. So individuals that are living in the stress of a large North American urban environment, those people that are eating a Mediterranean style diet are doing better cognitively. Um, but I think the other piece of it is also letting you know that eating this way doesn't mean that you have to be sitting down to Slovakia and, and Lusaka every night. That it's not the Mediterranean diet per se, but it's the attributes of the Mediterranean diet that are healthy. So it's the fact that it's a diet that is high in fruits and vegetables, it's high in whole grains, avoids those highly processed foods. So, and I think particularly living in the multicultural environment that we do in Toronto, it's really important to take that information from the Mediterranean diet and help us incorporate it into our own culture rather than trying to force people into uh, a, a peg or a hole that may not, uh, that may not particularly fit. Our brain health is not something that is only uh, driven by our genetics. Our lifestyle choices are, uh, are actually more important in terms of determining our own brain health. Um, that we have the opportunity in terms of making certain that we're going to be able to enjoy those retirement years, the ones that we've worked for so often, provided that we're making the right lifestyle choices so in, our, in our middle adulthood. So I would like to argue that our glass is way more than half full, um, that we don't have to accept dementia as something that's inevitable, uh, and that it's really trying to look at as you're planning Freedom 55 to me, not only means financial freedom, but it also means freedom from dementia. Um, and we do have the tools in order to help you do that. So thank you very much.